Welcome to Lifestyles of the Strange and Exotic Classic Book Review. Have I got this like Elvis thing going here with the collar? I don't know. This is a series of book reviews I will be doing on classic Star Trek novels. At least this first part. I might delve deeper into my other books. But for the most part, they will be Star Trek because those are the novels I like to read. <sighs> Let's see, which one should I review? Da -da 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 -da. Uh, I think I will mention this one. There's one more in this particular little pile that I will review on. These are four or five of my favorite. How many do I got? One, two, four, anyways, of my favorite books. And this one is called Star Trek, and it's from the Worlds Apart series. Though I've never seen any other ones other than this, and it is a standalone novel. You don't need the other other novels in this series. And this one's. How Much for Just a Planet by John M. Ford. Now, I must warn you, if you read this book, wear a diaper because you will wet yourself laughing. This is How Much for Just a Planet, Dilithium. In crystalline form, the most valuable mineral in the galaxy. It powers the Federation's starships and the Klingon Empire's battlecruisers. Now on a small, out-of-the-way planet named Doriety, the greatest fortune in dilithium crystals have has ever been found. Oh, let me start that over. Now on a small out-of-the-way planet named Doriety, the greatest fortune in dilithium crystals ever seen has been found. Much better in English. Under the terms of the Organian Peace Treaty, the planet will go to the side best able to develop the planet and its resources. Each side will contest the prize with the prime of its fleet. For the Federation, Captain James T. Kirk and the Starship Enterprise. For the, Kate, for the Klingons, Captain Caden Vestai Opry and the Fire Blossom. Only the Doridians are writing their own script for this contest. A script that propels the crew of the Starship Enterprise into the stranger's adventure yet. And they, when they mean script, they mean it literally. And it's called Plan C. And this is number 36, but I don't know if... Yep, okay. And this one was published in 1987. So it's been around a while. And this, this particular book was uh, a reissue. <clears throat> a classic Star Trek novel at a classic price. And this was $4. So I guess the original printing was 87 But I don't see when this particular issuing was released. It didn't tell me. Now, the, the, the credits for this book is really kind of cal give you a slight taste of what's in the book. This book is dedicated with affection to its special guest stars. Pamela and David, Diane and Peter, Janet and Ricky, and Neil who wanted to walk on. An acknowledgement is also gratefully made to W. Shakespeare, G. Fadu, W. S. Gilbert, and the silent comedians named in verse 2 of Monochrome, without whose work there would never been no tradition to steal from. So <laughs> And it's so hard like to like not tell you the punchline before the joke. And this is the front page. You think we can help? Kirk asked. You playing against these pretty nobles? That is bold, Captain Caden said, twisting the cap from his fourth bottle of beer. That is the way of the line founder, and I salute it. But what if we're discovering oh but what if we are discovering interfering with your planet? Would not the light bulbs object? He looked at the bottle cap in his hand and tossed it aside as if it were hot. Light bulbs, B said. Organians, Kirk said. It's a habit they have. Well, never mind that. I don't think this should make any difference at all with them. It's not like we're trying to influence your world's decision on the lithium rights. No, Caden said quickly. Of course not, Pete said. Absolutely, Kirk said. Nothing like it, Caden added. Well, Kirk smiled. I'm glad we understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and Pete is a character that's that likes this girl and they have to like pretend to like kidnap Pete while well, the girl has the same plan and she's given him the like Uhura and the female Klingon the same spiel uh let's see <laughs> basically if Star Trek did a musical it would be this book I mean literally there are parts where the, the people of Doriety break into song where's Oh, I wish I could figure out which page that was where 
he starts singing, <laughs> I ain't got nobody. Uh, oh, is this the beginning where they first meet them? Okay. This is a little ways in, and they're on the planet. People were pouring out of the big building and, and the town. They were, they were all brightly dressed, and there was a rising sound of voices. Suddenly a bass drum sounded from the trolley car pavilion, and then a brass band came to life. The crowd began singing. We thought you might like to know that you'll get a down-home welcome in our little town. We hope you never want to go. It's really great you have. Someone strange hanging round. See how our friendly neighbors step back as you pass. Please put your trash in the baskets and stay off the grass. You'll only get one warning. We thought you might like to know. Kirk said, I've never been met quite like this before. Kirk was humming in time to the bright brassy music. Sulu waved to the townspeople. McCoy said, What was that about baskets? The ambassador said, Well, I think that's charming. And of course, the ambassador was an old flame of Kirk's, like, the. <laughs> the song continues. We thought that you would m that you might like to know we'd like to entertain you our merry old way, so every hearth will be aglow and there's nothing quite so warm as an auto de fe. We've been on pins and needles since you first appeared. We hope you don't have plans to do anything weird. We're very open-minded though. We thought that you might like to know. As the music faded, Sulu began singing brightly, though not terribly loudly, from charge in tremural to prettiness rural. The sudden tradition. The sudden transition is simply Elysian. Almost before he stopped, the horror sang to a different meter. By a simple coincidence, few could ever have counted upon the same thing occurred to me when I first put this uniform on. <laughs> and Chief Engineer Scott, grinning fit the burst, added, Now to the banquet we pass, now for the eggs and ham, now for the mustard and cress, and now for the strawberry jam. <laughs> now picture these Starfleet officers singing to these things. Kirk had an expression of mingled awe and bewilderment. McCoy's eyebrows were hanging out of the clouds. Gilbert and Sullivan, all three singers chorused and bowed slightly to the captain. Yeah, that's pretty much all the way through the book. I mean, they're not all singing all the way through the book. That's the mentality there in the book. And it's it's basically if a planet was an entire sane asylum. <laughs> And there's actually a reason for their ma madness, and you'll find that out near the end. And <laughs> oh, is this the big? Oh, okay, I think this is the one too where they had the um, inflatable starship. Heaven forbid if you call it a balloon. And it's it's basically made like a decoy, and it makes a reappearance at the end of the book. You know, <laughs> hey. It, it's, 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 seriously, you will wet yourself laughing. I mean, it's like there's, they're so set in their ways in a way, in the entire book, everybody is so off balance because you just don't know where anything is going to be coming from and it's so outside their sphere of what they know. And it's hysterically funny to find these, you know, mature, you know, intelligent people being forced to be silly and, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's really, really funny. Genshin's a boy, he's only, and they team up with different people, where Hoor's with a Klingon, Kirk is with his old flame and a Klingon, and, and it's funny trying to picture Klingons going through this too, and they're just as, they just have bad days like the rest of <laughs> and, it's really, really funny. <clears throat> I mean, I would like to see this as a Broadway play, basically. It's, it's you know, Star Trek does Broadway. So, <laughs> if you have any sense of, like, musical ear, maybe you could hear a tune to go with the words, but I can't, so. To me, they're like poems, I don't know. <laughs> but, but try to picture, you know, a bunch of people singing to the crew of the Enterprise and a bunch of Klingons. Why they have, uh... Christopher Lee, Christopher Lloyd there on the cover, I don't know, because that's not the Klingon that's in here. I can't bring Michael. You can't even read. Can you read that? <clears throat> so, if this is definitely a weird Star Trek book, but it's a fun, weird book. And even if you read it more than once, the jokes never get old. 
<laughs> you know, you kind of look at it in different ways. That's why I like, Mother's like, why do you read the same book over and over again? It's like, well, there's different characters. Look at it from one point of view. Look at it from another point of view. Focus on one thing. It's different ways to read the same book. So it never gets old. So this is definitely a fun joy ride. Mm, this is How Much for Just a Planet by John M. Ford. I don't know what other books are in this particular series. I don't think it tells me. It does not tell me. But again, this is a standalone book. You don't need to read the other books in the series. It might be just a series of classic books reissued. Definitely worth a check out. And thank you all for watching. Comment down below if you'd like to see more. Though I might make you watch them anyway. Do subscribe. I would be ever so grateful. And I shall see you all next time.